Apologies. All right, well, thank you all for coming. We're uh, delighted today to have with us uh, Professor Joanna Dunkley, although I don't think I've ever heard anybody call you that. <laughs> so uh, uh, Joe's research career uh, began as a graduate student at Oxford. She moved to uh, Princeton as a postdoc. Uh, then she went back to Oxford to join the faculty. And as we heard from Avi at lunch today, perhaps the cycle will repeat again. <laughs> Uh, but uh, um, uh, through uh, her research career and over 100 very highly cited papers, there are a couple of really distinguishing characteristics. One of them is a consistent and very sophisticated application uh, of um, uh, 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 powerful statistical techniques to extract the maximum possible fundamental physics out of very complicated cosmological data sets. And Joe has been a real leader in that. And the second characteristic is the breadth of the projects that she is able been able to contribute to. I guess that's correlated with the first part. She's been highly sought after. I think perhaps the only person I'm aware of, at least, who is a member of both of the major CMB satellite projects, WMAP and Planck, uh, in the last decade, and also a uh, major ground-based experiment, uh, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Uh, she's uh, led major uh, analyses for all of those experiments. She's been involved not just in, in the interpretation of the cosmic microwave background, and isotropies, but also large-scale structure, data sets, uh, data sets of uh, galaxy clusters, uh, um, anisotropies of the cosmic infrared background, uh, galactic foregrounds. Uh, and uh, uh, so um, I should say that Joe was awarded the 2013 Maxwell Medal for her work on WMAP and ACT, uh, and in 2014 got the Royal Society's Fowler Prize. Uh, and we are delighted that she's joining us here briefly today uh, at CFA. So please join me in welcoming Joe Dunkley. Thanks, John. That was a really kind introduction. Um, so yeah, I've, been, I've actually been incredibly lucky to work on um, a whole bunch of CMB experiments. I'm not an experimentalist myself, so I think you, know, you have to try and pay your dues by analyzing the data as hard as you can, um, and occasionally going out to Chile to do a bit of work. But as a theorist, I'm uh, <laughs> not as handy as some are at getting experiments actually physically working. Um, OK, so yeah, I'm delighted to be here today. It's great also to hear the latest results from the BICEP and Keck experiments today. Um, I want to talk about. Um, that the, the two things that are really exciting me at the moment in terms of discoveries that I think we will either make or could make in the next five to ten years um, from cosmological data. And the first one is um, understanding the physics of neutrinos. Um, that, that we've got a couple of questions outstanding about neutri the neutrino sector. Um, and we want to find out what the masses of the neutrino particles are. And we'd like to know for sure if there are just three of them. Um, and this is interesting physics that we can contribute to in astrophysics and contribute to with our particle physics colleagues. Um, and the other one we, we heard about, those of us who were here early on today, um, what are the physics that, that, that um, describe the initial expansion of the universe? Um, and these are vastly different scales. The neutrinos are kind of these tiny sub-electron volt particles on the one end, and on the other end, you've got 10 to the 16 GeV scales of the thing that was perhaps driving the initial expansion of the universe. Um, our best idea is cosmic inflation. I'll, I'll come back to that um, uh, in more depth. Did it happen, and, and what drove it? Um, so neutri I think neutrinos is, um, I, you know, we, we've heard a lot about it recently, too, from uh, the recent Nobel Prize. Um, awarded for the discovery of neutrino flavor oscillations and, and their mass. So here, we think that there are uh, certainly at least three neutrino species. Um, they've got three, there's, there's at least three types, and they can oscillate their flavors between each other. Um, and we know that there are three active types of neutrino measured by particle physics um, observations. Um, but we don't know if there are any more than that. There could be additional sterile neutrinos. And we don't know if there are any additional relativistic particles in the universe that aren't just neutrinos, whether there could be axions or other sub-EV particles out there. Um, but even if it's just the three, uh, we also don't know what the, we don't know what gives the neutrinos their mass. Um, and we don't know what the absolute masses of these particles are. 
from oscillation experiments, we know the mass differences between these three, kind, these three, three neutrino species. Um, and if we put, so here what I'm showing is um, three different masses um, of neutrino particles. Um, and they can either be distributed in this normal hierarchy with two lighter masses and one heavier one, or an inverted hierarchy with one lighter mass and two heavier ones. Um, but this minimum, this, this floor is unknown, and which of these, or which, if it's a normal or inverted, is also unknown. Um, if, it's, if it's this one, and if that floor is zero, then the minimum mass sum of all the neutrino particles is about 0.06 electron volts. And that's something we can reach in cosmology in the next 10 years. We can actually detect, we can detect this. Um, and I, I think that's really exciting. Um, so on the other end, so that's the EV, the very, very tiny electro, sub-electron volt scale. On the other end, we've got um, cosmic inflation. Uh, you you've, have heard a lot about this here, <laughs> um, but I'm still interested in it. <laughs> so, so it's our best idea for what was happening in, in the early universe, um, a period of exponential expansion driven by um, the potential of some um, inflaton scalar field. And we don't know what that scalar field um, is, or we don't even know if this happened. Um, it's our best, it's the most popular scenario, um, but we don't yet have convincing evidence that it really did happen. So in that scenario, you've got some, we had some, at very early time, some scalar field, um, some inflaton field, and the expansion of the universe is driven by the potential of that field, and it will have some shape, V of phi, um, and it might have a shape like this. Um, and as, that, as we roll down the potential, the universe um, it expands exponentially, and then it stops. Um, and it's a nice mechanism because it gives rise to the geometric flatness of the universe that we see. Um, it gives, predicts the isotropy that we expect to see. Um, it was invented here in Boston and Harvard. <laughs> um, uh, not, sorry, not Harvard. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> in Boston. <laughs> Ignore me, I'm being filmed. Um, <laughs> um, um, and it also predicts, um, um, it, what's really nice about it is that it predicts the primordial fluctuations. It predicts the seeds of the cosmic structure that we see today. Um, quantum fluctuations in that, in, in that inflaton field um, uh, stretch from microscopic quantum, quantum fluctuations to macroscopic scales during that exponential expansion. And they're frozen in and they can then begin to evolve and they can then, over billions of years, form everything that we see out in the, in, in the sky now. Um, and all of the features of those fluctuations, um, all the predictions of those, of those fluctuations have so far agreed very well with our current data. Um, so you put in these quantum fluctuations and you put in these tiny perturbations at uh, very early times and the perturbations have these characteristics. Um, the distribution of, the, of those very perturbations should be Gaussian, and we see that in the data. Um, it should be adiabatic, which means if you have a perturbation in the matter over here, you also have a, a perturbation or an overdensity in photons, in dark matter, in baryons. Everything perturbs the same because it came from some initial perturbation in some inflaton field. So they have to trace each other, and that's adiabatic, and it's what we see. Um, it also predicts that you should have roughly the same, same amount of fluctuations on all different scales, approximate scale invariance. The size of fluctuations roughly the same on different scales. That's what we see. Um, the fluctuations should be slightly smaller on smaller scales than large scales. Um, that's what we see. <laughs> Every, everything so far is, is, what we expect, is what we expect from inflation. But this key thing that um, many of us are looking for with different experiments is um, that it should predict not just the density fluctuations that produce all of the you know, cosmic structure that we see around us, the, the galaxies and the clusters of galaxies. Um, it should also predict, the, the quantum fluctuation should also put in tensor fluctuations to the metric. These are um, space-time fluctuations that propagate as gravitational waves. They don't cluster and form a density fluctuations. They just propagate through space with a little cartoon. If this is a gravitational wave passing towards you, <laughs> space itself will be shrinking and stretching in either that mode or in this mode. Um, and we quantify 
the size of these tensor fluctuations with the tensor to scalar ratio r. And that r scales uh, with the energy scale of inflation. So if this r is about 0.01, then the energy scale of inflation is about 10 to the 16 GeV. Um, and, and we'd like to detect that number, many of us would, um, and we'd like to know what the number is. And then it, connect, it can tell us about the um, actual field. So these two, these two, these two questions, physics of, the, of inflation and the physics of neutrinos, um, much, much information about those two, in particular about inflation, but also about neutrinos, comes from the cosmic microwave background. Um, so we're capturing, we measure microwave light around us that's been traveling since 400,000 years when the universe became neutral. Before then, it was ionized plasma with photons scattering off the electrons, and then the universe cooled down enough that the photons can travel, and they can travel to us. And we see them here. This is the map that made from the Planck satellite, where this is the all-sky view of the temperature of, these microwave <laughs> of this microwave light um, that we can map in all directions around us. So it's a snapshot of part of the sky at 400,000 years um, with, you know, micro Kelvin level fluctuate or tens of micro Kelvin level fluctuations in temperature around a mean of 2.7 Kelvin, which I've subtracted here. This is just the anisotropy. Um, and so these little fluctuations roughly trace the density of the universe at 400,000 years. Um, so we're getting a snapshot of, of, of the tiny uh, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing how those initial fluctuations that we perhaps put in inflation have evolved to 400,000 years, and we're seeing them um, here. Um, and we, we can only do a lot with that. Um, the, the main thing we do, and I'm going to show a few of these plots, and I've, I've tried to be careful to label their axes as, it's, I, I, they tend to be power spectra of a map. Um, and I, and I like to think of it as really just the variance in the map as a function of scale in the map. And I've tried to put these labels on because sometimes we use different labels for this, this quantity. And what's really important is it's just the power spectrum or the variance in, this, in a map of the CMB as a function of scale. Um, I'll show a few different ones of these. And so when we take the map of the CMB, we compute its power spectrum. And from the Planck data that's shown here with these red data points. Um, and so you see this. Um, so as we're going from these large scales to small scales, you should imagine breaking up this map of the anisotropy into increasing larger, sorry, increasing smaller scales. These are kind of stepping up in spherical harmonic multipoles, and I'm breaking it up into those scales, and I'm saying, what are the fluctuations on these successive scales? Out to, you know, here we've got L of a multipole of 2,000 or so. So this would be on, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.1 degree scales, smaller, a few, a few up minute scales. So um, we, we see this, this plateau out here at the largest scales in the sky, and then the sequence of oscillations. And the plateau corresponds to very large scale modes, um, scales in the sky, where at, when the CMB formed, these initial fluctuations that we perhaps put in an inflation um, are not in causal contact. And they've just, they haven't begun to do anything more than just, just grow. Um, they're not inside the cosmic hor the horizon. Um, and so we don't see any features on those very large scales. And then we come into these smaller scales and we see these acoustic, these, these, these ripples, we call them acoustic peaks. Um, and, and here uh, we've got scales of fluctuations that are inside the cosmic horizon by the time that we, we capture the CMB. And what happens is you have some initial fluctuation um, and this tightly coupled photon baryon uh, plasma responds to that fluctuation. And so you've got competing, competing gravity of the baryons and pressure of the photons, and that sets up a sound wave through the plasma. And we capture the sound wave um, at 400,000 years, and different length scales have reached different um, uh, points in their, in their oscillation, and so we see these, these, these ripples. Um, and so just from, this is just the, the temperature anisotropy from Planck, and this is what's really given us our kind of standard lambda CDM cosmological model. This is a flat, it's a flat cosmology. Uh, it's got certain amounts of dark matter, baryons, photons. Um, it's got a cosmological constant. 
Um, and it's got very simple primordial fluctuations of the kind that inflation predicts, described by just two numbers. Um, but we've gone on past that. <laughs> um, um, I, so, so, so here, I want to tell you about um, um, an experiment we're using to make some measurements uh, that, that push beyond Planck, um, which is from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope um, in Chile. Uh, it's pictured here. It's at the other site on Earth that we tend to do CMB studies, <laughs> as opposed to the South Pole, um, where many people here work. Um, it's, it's a great location. It's up at 5,000 meters uh, in, in the Atacama Desert. It's very near Alma. It's on the plateau, just, just next to um, the Alma Plateau. Um, and it's pictured here, a telescope sitting inside this big ground screen. You can see a zoom in more here. Um, and it's a big six meter dish uh, microwave telescope um, that is custom built to observe the, the CMB. Um, and it's been operating since 2007. And I've kind of used these, these, these names to tell you what stages of the operations they've happened at. We ran it first from 2007 to 10. Um, with its first camera on, on board um, that was just, could just measure the temperature, the intensity of CMB light. It couldn't measure anything like polarization. Um, but it could measure in, in fine resolution because the, it's got a six minute dish and so it can measure arc minute resolution of the microwave background. And so this is a, it's a big collaboration. It's about 70 of us led by Lyman Page and, and, and now um, with future programs led by Suzanne Staggs. Um, and so from that, we've kind of added to, uh, by zooming in on smaller scales, you can extend the picture seen from Planck. So I'm showing you now again with a sort of a log scale, again, the variance in the CMB map as a function of angular scale. Again, the angular scale's up here. Um, and here are the Planck data in the blue data points, and then data from, from ACT, our telescope, and the South Pole telescope, another telescope at the South Pole, um, <laughs> on top as well. And they extend right out to this L of 4,000, which is um, just a, a few arc minute scales. <laughs> so it's really, and this, so you're, we're spanning now this kind of vast array of angular ranges. Um, and, and this model that goes through all those data points is, is, this, is, this, is this Lambda CDM um, cosmological model. Um, so so pushing, to, pushing to higher resolution has, told us with this sort of even more confidence this, that this is right, or at least it's the best fit model right now. It doesn't tell us it's right. <laughs> OK. Um, so let me say something. So, so OK, so I want to, how do we find out about neutrinos from this kind of data? Um, if I want to figure out how, if I want to find out how many neutrino species or how many relativistic particles species there are in the universe, how do I do that? Well. I can imagine that if I put in more neutrino species or more relativistic species that don't um, uh, behave, couple electromagnetically, then I should imagine kind of putting in an extra relativistic component in the early universe that doesn't behave like photons. It doesn't scatter off electrons. It's just, um, it's, it's just, um, it's non-interacting. Um, and what that does is that it affects um, the sound waves in the photon baryon tightly coupled plasma. Because basically, you can imagine switching out some of the photons for neutrinos, and they're not coupled to the baryons anymore. Um, and so the net effect, depending on which parameters you fix, is the oscillations become more damped in a universe with more neutrino species. And actually, you, you, kind of, you shift the peak positions of the CMB because the neutrino, oscillate, neutrino perturbations travel, propagate differently to, to photon ones. So let me just show you, so as an example, and there were too many curves on here, so I only want to look at the blue one. I'll point out to it. This shows the variance in the, CM in the CMB map as a function, again, of angular scale, large to small. The dashed line is standard three, a three neutrino universe. Um, and the blue one, just there, I'm sorry about the overlapping colors, down here is a 10 neutrino species universe, which sounds kind of absurd, um, but actually until just recently, was totally fine cosmologically. Ten, a universe with 10 neutrino species um, fit the data, uh, no problem. Because until recently, we didn't have any observations at these small scales where these models clearly differ because of the different behavior. Um, and so just to, oops, 
show that in show the effect then of, of, of making these higher resolution observations of the CMB. This shows the distribution, the expected, the, the probability of a number of neutrino particles, where from the previous satellite from Doubly Map, uh, here was the curve that happily included nine or ten, and just about excluded zero. Um, and then adding in higher resolution data, squeezed it down to here uh, with an error bar of, of, of 0.5. And then with the Planck data, which are um, higher fidelity, that error is down to 0.3. So already this is, um, this is disfavoring, uh, you know, three sigma, a whole extra relativistic uh, neutrino, a neutrino particle species. Um, it doesn't rule out a different kind of relativistic particle that contributes only a fraction of an effective neutrino species. It could be an axion particle that contributes less. Um, but it's certainly going towards, towards three. Um, and this is, the, this is the number that, in 10 years, we should shrink it, that error bar, by a factor of 10. Um, so if it's not 3, um, we're going to find out. Um, and for a while, it was hovering up closer to 4, and that was temporarily uh, tantalizing. But it seems to be now still preferring to be back at, back at closer to the 3 we expect. More information about neutrinos comes from the lensing of the CMB. So uh, the CMB is it's coming from redshift of 1,000, uh, but it's being gravitationally deflected by all the large-scale structure it travels past on its, on its path to us. Um, and I can imagine that the, temp the, the temperature of the CMB light in any direction uh, on the sky, uh, the lensed one is actually the unlensed CMB in some direction, uh, plus a deflection angle. So every photon is deflected by a certain angle on its way to me. Um, and I can write down that angle as the gradient of some deflection field. Sorry, I'm sorry. I can write it as, as, as the gradient of some lensing potential, phi. Um, and I can make a map of that, phi, of that lensing potential, phi, that the, that the CMB sees. And this is, this is what we've made from, from Planck in the large, the large map. And in, zoomed in is, is, the map, is, a, is a smaller map of it made from, from ACT. Um, and so what this is, is it's really a measure of the integrated matter along the line of sight from here out to last scattering, weighted by some distance factors. Um, it's just an integral of, of, of the matter power spectrum. Uh, it typically picks up most of the information about redshift 2, redshift 1, but it's got contributions from higher redshifts and from lower redshifts nearby. So where you see it being blue, it means that there's slightly less matter along the line of sight in that direction than on average, and the red is slightly more matter. Um, <coughs> and what we can do with it, as we like to do, is, again, we compute its power spectrum, the power spectrum of that lensing map, um, and compute its power spectrum, or it's the variance in the lensing map, again, as a function of angular scale from large to small scales. Um, and that's shown here in a compilation from, from, um, from Planck in the, in the boxes here, um, an act in SPT shown in blue, agree, in blue and green from ground-based data. And this curve is the amount of lensing potential you would expect in a lambda CDM universe, a sim, uh, the, the, re the regular cosmology universe. Um, and the data seemed to like that. The data fit that very well. Um, but again, they didn't have to. A universe that, that had uh, a different amount of dark energy or had some curvature, it could have looked fine with respect to the primary CMB signal, but it would have given quite a different lensing signal. It could have given almost twice as much, and it would have looked fine with the primary CMB, and it doesn't look fine with lensing. So it's quite powerful because um, you get to probe the late-time universe, uh, whereas, you know, originally we've always thought of the CMB as being the probe of, mainly the probe of, of just redshift of a, a thousand. So, keeping on the neutrino path, um, right, how does, how now does the mass of neutrinos affect the CMB, um, and in particular, the, the CMB lensing? Um, well, massive neutrinos in the kind of mass range we think they are, they start off relativistic, and then as the universe cools down, they transition to being effectively just cold dark matter. And that happens at about redshift of, 
I don't know, a hundred or a few hundred. So when the CMB formed, they were relativistic. But in all the large scale structure we see nearby redshift one, two, three, they're basically <clears throat> behaving like cold dark matter. Um, and that, that difference is, is really what means that we can actually um, measure the mass because um, they don't look like either photons or like cold dark matter if we can track them over their whole history. Um, so while they're behaving uh, like relativistic particles in the early universe, they suppress the formation of structure. They free stream. They don't clump together like cold dark matter. And so structure, cosmic structures, formation is reduced um, compared to just cold dark matter. So um, if we put, if we kind of imagine a whole a dark matter, a dark matter budget, and I now switch some of it from being cold dark matter into being uh, massive neutrinos, then I get more suppression of my structure formation um, and less CMB lensing um, if I increase the mass of the neutrinos. So I've shown this, this effect here. Um, this is the fractional effect on the variance or the matter power spectrum, the variance in the matter um, um, in the barrier and I can dark matter as a function of physical scale. So this is um, uh, 10 megaparsec scales here. Um, if the sum of neutrino masses is you know, 0.1 or 0.2 or 0.3 electron volts, you suppress the amount of clustering on these smaller scales by you know, 5% or 10% compared to the um, zero neutrino mass model. Uh, the CMB lensing is just an integral of the matter power spectrum. And so the same thing shows up in the CMB lensing power spectrum is this suppression of power for different neutrino masses. So I'm showing this now to you here, which is uh, just the theory, theory curves of the variance in the lensing map um, as a function of angular scale. Um, and if you increase the, the neutrino mass, you decrease the amount of lensing. Um, and this is in a case where I fix the total amount of dark matter. I've just switched some, some of it from cold into into neutrinos, into warm neutrinos. So I reduce it. Uh, now, one thing to note is that at the larger scales, um, uh, I don't get any suppression, but neither do I get to actually measure those scales very easily. The data that we get from CMB lensing really covers like these angular scales. So really, neutrino mass just looks like a suppression of, 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 of cosmic structure. It doesn't have much scale dependence. Um, so this is what's given us um, this neat upper limit on the sum of neutrino masses, 0.7 EV from just from CMB data. Um, but we can do better. And we do better with the kind of data that um, many people here work on, um, Daniel Eisenstein and others, which is that we can um, also use cosmic distances to improve the estimate of neutrino masses. I mean, there are many ways of doing it. So let me, as an aside, I'm going to present to you one path to get the neutrino mass. There are actually a number of cosmological measurements that can be combined to do similar things, um, which is great, because it means that if we want to make this measurement, we'll have some different routes to it. This is just one of the routes. Um, so now, OK, I've said, I've said, how does neutrino mass, how does it affect the clustering, how does it affect CMB lensing or the clustering of matter? Now we can think about how does it affect um, dis cosmic distances angular diameter distances to galaxies. Um, and actually, neutrinos at late times behave basically like cold dark matter. So if I'm measuring distances to redshift one or two, one or two then I can't really, really tell the difference between cold dark matter and neutrinos, because neutrinos are already behaving like cold dark matter. Um, so instead, I can use angular diameter distances to low redshifts um, as a way of measuring the total matter. Um, the total cold dark matter and, and neutrino matter. Um, and so, um, well, actually, I'm just going to just look at this one. This, this, is, this, this cartoon is, I want to show you the sort of degeneracy directions for CMB lensing versus um, angular diameter distances measured by B, um, barren acoustic oscillation measurements. So here, okay, so up here, I've got cold dark matter density up here, so not neutrinos. And along here, I've got neutrino mass or neutrino matter mass density. Measuring nearby distances, 
nearby-ish. <laughs> I call Redshift 1 or 2 nearby, but it's not really. Um, uh, constrains me along this path where I've just, I've just got to have, I've just, I'm just measuring the total matter in the universe, in the late time universe. I can't tell the difference between matter, colder matter and, and neutrino mass. Um, so this is a degen degeneracy with the BAO um, distance measures. Then orthogonal to that is the CMB lensing <laughs> degeneracy, where if I increase the neutrino mass, I decrease the CMB lensing, I suppress cluster formation, but I can counteract that actually by increasing the dark matter density, colder matter density, which will then boost the clustering, boost the growth. So it's the, actually, it's the opposite direction to the, the galaxy, the distances to galaxies, which is incredibly useful um, because this, 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 it means that you can, if you measure the CMB lensing, the growth of structure, and you measure distances, you get to increase your information about um, the neutrino mass. Um, and that's, that leads us to the current limits. Okay, so, so here, so using this combination of data, and so, so we've, the current combination of data that does that is, is Planck CMB data and um, uh, Baron acoustic oscillation measurements from BOSS, from Sloan. And so doing that, you get this so 0.7 EV upper limit just from Planck. Um, but you go down to 0.23 or so from Planck and BAO measurements. Um, and 0.23 is now getting towards, it's getting interesting. So what this plot shows is, is comparing what we're going to do from cosmology to what you can do from lab-based neutrino measurements. Um, this is the sum of neutrino masses along here. And this is uh, the mass of the electron neutrino which is what people uh, um, have been measuring and preparing to measure with, two, with new measurements, with lab-based measurements. Um, and these are the predicted curves for in the inverted hierarchy and the normal hierarchy where the neutrinos could lie. So the minimum mass is down there, but it could be up there and it could be somewhere higher up along this curve. Um, so right now, from lab, the lab-based measurements, coming down from the top are actually way they're, they're up at 2 EV only. Um, I mean, it's still impressive. Um, and the capturing experiment that's, 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 coming, that's coming online is aiming to get to 0.2 EV down there. But that's just for the lightest um, neutrino, that's for the electron neutrino. Um, so that won't get anywhere near the minimal mass in a normal hierarchy of neutrinos. This, this yellow shaded curve is where we expect to be in a decade from lab-based measurements down here. But actually, we'll, we'll expect to have gone down further than that with um, new cosmology measurements. So, you know, it's, it's, um, that's, we're getting towards something interesting now. And it is, as I said before, this is a number that we expect to need to add to our cosmological model in the next 10 years. We know it's a non-lambda CDM parameter. It's a non-lambda CDM part of, part of our cosmological model, and we need it. Um, and um, if, it, if we don't need it, then something else very strange is going on. <laughs> um, OK, so how are we going to do better? <laughs> Back to the title of my talk. Um, doing better on this and also doing better on inflation um, is, is um, Part of the route to that is making better measurements of the polarization of the CMB. Um, we, we heard about this at lunchtime today, but I'm just going to go over it a little bit. Um, the CMB gets polarized if you have, you need free electrons for CMB to, to scatter off. I need a particular pattern of incident radiation where you have um, quadrupole anisotropy. So here, for example, I've got, uh, cartoon-wise, I've got hotter light coming in here uh, and actually from the other side as well, and colder light coming in top and bottom. And when they scatter out towards me, they come out linearly polarized. And that only works if you've got, as I said, um, for example, hotter light coming in side to side, colder top and bottom, and then when it scatters out towards you, it comes out net polarized in, like, in this, like, like this, this light. Right, sort of. Um, whereas if it was isotropic radiation, you wouldn't. It wouldn't. It would come out unpolarized. Um, so this physical setup happens 
mainly there's a couple of things that, that do it. The dominant, the dominant cause of semipolarization happens during uh, recombination, while the CMB is forming, while the universe is becoming neutral. Um, during that little epoch, um, you start to get free electrons, but you still got um, um, CMB photons uh, to scatter off them. And um, the polarization ends up picking up the perturbations in the velocity of, the photo, of this tightly coupled photon baryon fluid. The temperature, as I said, roughly traces the, de the density, although it actually traces the combination of the density and the velocity, whereas the polarization is really just measuring the motion of the photon baryon fluid um, at recombination. And that's, really, that's actually really useful. Um, so we measure, the way we quantify it is, you know, you measure, a CMB, you measure a photon, you measure its intensity, and then you measure what direction it's polarized in. Um, so you can either quantify the polarization in terms of a polarization intensity and an angle, or you can break it down into Stokes Q and U vectors. So you can say on the sky, is it going to be, um, um, uh, how much the polarization is in uh, Stokes Q, which would have this orientation or this orientation, and how much is Stokes U with these uh, 45 degree orientations. And that's the measurement we make with our telescopes and map on the sky. Uh, but to then actually do, do, do um, physics with that, we decompose them into these two polarization patterns. One that is a pure divergence part of any polarization field on the sky, the E mode, and the other that's the pure curl-like part of the field, the, the B mode. Um, and the, the motion of the baryon photon fluid at recombination, the tracing of the, the velocity um, of the perturbations at that time, it all produces this sort. None of, that, none of the density fluctuations at recombination produced any of this, only that sort. And that's the dominant polarization of the CMB. I'll come back to the B modes again. So uh, again, I'm coming back to the experiment that, that I'm working on um, uh, in Chile. This is an, an, another picture of it from a little further away. Uh, that's, that's us there. Um, since we started in 2007, we've got neighbors. Uh, so this is now becoming quite a developed CMB polarization site uh, now that we're in what I'm calling stage two of our observations. So here's us, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope there, ACT. This is why it was being constructed, so you can kind of see the telescope inside what's now its ground screen. Um, and now we have uh, neighbors, the polar bear experiment, um, which is sitting just there. It's the slightly smaller, one slightly smaller telescope measuring the CMB that's now building a couple of replicas to measure it in more detail too. Um, and the class experiment um, led by Chuck Bennett at Johns Hopkins, that's now a site there. <laughs> it's, um, it's no longer a flat piece of empty piece of ground. Um, this, is, this is a smaller telescope measuring the CMB polarization at even lar at large scales without the fine resolution, but more, more dedicated towards the large scales. So it's a nice suite of um, experiments on that, on that same plateau. Um, so we've been measuring, so okay, so we've been since in the second sort of stage of our operations um, with a new camera called ACPOL, we've been measuring the polarization of the CMB at higher resolution um, over, for now, smallish patches of the sky. Let me show you where they are. Okay, so um, this is a map of the sky um, with the galaxy here, uh, so it's an equatorial coordinates. Um, and the brightly colored region is the region that we could observe from Chile, but in our first year of observing, we just observed little small regions along the equator uh, in these little, the red circled regions. Um, and here are four examples, CMB maps made in just the temperature in those regions here. Uh, um, and we selected them partly to have overlap with, with observations with other wavelengths as well. Um, in the last couple of years that we've been observing with, with ACPOL, um, we've had a little wider coverage. Um, the coverage I'm showing you is these patches here. That's when been main, where most of our work has been done. We spent a little bit of time down, down here as well. And here is the region that um, the bicep CAC experiments observed down here. So we're quite complementary. We've been up on, on the equator, again, mainly because of the overlap with other experiments. We wanted to overlap with BOSS data. Um, with weak lensing surveys um, and um, other observations. Uh, this is just an example then of, of 
seeing the sky in um, now in the so now we're measuring the polarization and isotropy. So rather than looking at the fluctuations in temperature, we're now looking at the fluctuations in the polarization intensity, either in Q or U Stokes vectors. And these are maps from ACPOL. And then you decompose them, these Q and U maps into these divergence-like E modes and the divergence-less B modes. Um, and all the signal for us is in the E mode. For us, with the first season of ACPOL, our B modes are too noisy to see something from. That's, that, that was not... Um, um, that was not our target, but we, but we have not got measurements of the B modes. Um, and then, so then you can, well, that's a bit large plot, sorry. <laughs> um, then we just play the same game as in temperature. We now compute the power spectrum of the polarization data as well. And this has been in tandem, sorry, let me backtrack a minute. We have not been doing this in isolation, as well as the other ground-based experiments. WMAP and Planck have both been measuring polarization of the CMB. WMAP measured it over the whole sky, Planck has measured it over the whole sky, and Planck has measured it in higher resolution than WMAP and has, and has um, got nice observations. Um, where we go beyond Planck with ACPOL and these other experiments from the ground is measuring in higher sensitivity and higher resolution, but they're in this, the, the general um, sphere of having Planck measurements as well. So. <coughs> Um, what, do we, what do we see? Um, up here is what I showed you before. This is the temperature anisotropy uh, measured by these experiments um, over this, this wide angular range. And then down here is the, are the fluctuations in those E-mode type polarization patterns. Um, in the blue, dark blue from Planck, um, the red is our, our ACPOL data. Um, and the blue is from um, the SPT pole experiment at the South Pole. And so, um, and in the, the grey is the, is, the, is the theory model that was predicted from the temperature, the, the one that fit the temperature, just lambda CDM, three, neut three neutrino species. Um, and it fits great. Um, you can see, of course, two, a couple of things should stand out. One is the polarization signal is uh, quite a lot smaller than temperatures, so where it's harder to measure. We've needed a new, better sensitivity to get to it. Um, clearly, if you look at the data, we haven't got the same size error bars yet than we have up here in the temperature. Um, but that's the, that's the goal moving forward of the rest of our observations right now and future measurements. Um, and right now, the conclusions are that, that everything from polarization looks consistent with temperature. Um, and that things like, for example, the number of neutrino species is still constrained to be perhaps a little better than it was before. But it's going to get, it's going to improve. And actually, the polarization is a better measurement of cosmological parameters, quantities that describe the universe, than the temperature. Because actually, these peaks, these wiggles, are more pronounced in the E mode than in the temperature. They're more smoothed out in the temperature because you have this actual combination of density and velocity perturbations being traced, whereas polarization just traces the velocity. Um, so actually, if you just wanted to choose one or the other, and you could do them both as well, you'd want to measure the polarization. Um, and so we expect from the rest of our ACPOL data to be able to shrink the number of neutrino species um, uncertainty in half, and then do even better with the next generation of experiments. Um, but right now, we are, trying, we are busy analyzing our new data. Uh, it's not ready for me to show right now of two years of our observations that will, that will shrink our errors on that, that spectrum further. I hope to have it done soon. Um, second thing, so that, that would be, that would be the, the path to progressing on the measuring the number of neutrinos. <coughs> the path to improving on our measurement of the neutrino mass comes from improving our measurement of the lensing getting that lensing map better. And one of the ways of doing that is that um, if you start off with an E-mode polarization pattern back at redshift of 1100, and then you lens that CMB light around the large scale structure, that deflection of the background light turns these E-modes, some of them, into B-modes. So you generate a B-mode type pattern purely from the lensing of, this, of the background E-mode. Um, and that helps you estimate the deflection field better. Um, because 
at the kind of scales we care about, nothing else should produce these B modes, not even gravitational waves, because we're talking about scales of um, uh, sub-degree, where any, any gravitational wave signal is not there. So any B mode signal comes from the lensing. And so we can use it to make a higher fidelity map of the, of the lensing potential. So right now I'm just showing you a, a um, preliminary result from our part of our ACPOL data, um, where this is now kind of going a little beyond Planck in measuring the variance in the lensing potential as a function of angular scale. Um, and these kind of angular scales are smaller than the ones that we currently are able to use from Planck. Um, and, and we expect these to continue to shrink and to continue to improve our neutrino mass measurements. Again, this is work that's in progress, but that's the path to doing it. Um, that should shrink it um, by, well, I'll show, I'll show you a plot in a moment about what we expect it to do. Um, okay, so then um, I, I'm going to be brief on this because we've heard a lot about this already today, is that polarization, I'm, I'm excited about polarizations, semi polarizations prospects for neutrinos, but on the other hand, you know, the very exciting other end of the energy scale is, is the gravitational waves. Um, and we can see them in the CMB because they also, if there were gravitational waves passing through uh, when the CMB formed, the impact they have, they, have, they basically impart a quadrupole distortion to space um, that polarizes a, CM, polarizes a CMB photon. If a CMB photon is scattering off an electron and a gravitational wave is there, then the uh, behavior of the, the space-time caused by the gravitational wave passing through uh, has exactly the right quadrupole pattern to polarize the CMB light. And it polarized it with both sorts, EMB modes. Um, and so here is a schematic, here is the, the theory, the expected signal, uh, the power spectrum or variance in a polarization map as a function of scale, where up here is the E mode signal from normal cosmic structure. <coughs> Down here is the expected signal just from the lensing of the E into the B modes. And then down here is the thing that we're all after, which is a measurement of the um, gravitational wave signal, um, the B modes produced by gravitational waves. And the shape we know, uh, or we predict from inflation, but the amplitude is uncertain. Um, and the well, this is out of date already, right? <laughs> um, the current best limits come from the BICEP2 and Keck experiments, which put that current upper limit uh, until uh, lunchtime at point <laughs> oh nine, combined with Planck, um, which was somewhere halfway in there, and it's still roughly around there. So we know that the, it, the signal can't be any bigger than like there, but it could be somewhere smaller. And so our approach uh, I'll just say it very quickly. Um, <coughs> uh, the thing we all know to be the challenge, uh, although it's kind of cool astrophysics um, on the way of doing it, is we have to look through the galaxy to see uh, this, this CMB polarization. And the galaxy is polarized. You know, we live about halfway out um, uh, from the galactic center on one of the spiral arms. And, we get to, and when we look out through the galaxy, we're looking through the galactic plane um, and even when we're looking off at the high latitudes, we're seeing some of the galactic plate and then also high latitude, um, also uh, emission higher up as well. So there's nowhere, there's nowhere on the sky we can look that's clean of emission from the galaxy. And the two dominant components that we have to deal with are synchrotron emission, which it's, if it's polarization as a function of frequency in gigahertz, synchrotron falls with frequency. Um, electrons spiraling in the magnetic field of the galaxy. And then at higher frequencies, we get thermal dust emission from dust grains that align perpendicular to the magnetic field in the galaxy. And they preferentially emit along their long axis, and they emit, so they emit perpendicular to the galactic plane. And synchrotron also emits preferentially perpendicular to the, the magnetic plane as well, so that they're aligned. Um, and um, it's... Modeling and removing these, these foregrounds is certainly the, probably the biggest challenge um, facing um, making the detection of um, a gravitational wave signature. Um, and this is just an example of you know, how we've learned so much more from Planck. And just um, recently, this is a map made of the dust polarization um, at 350 gigahertz in Stokes Q and U vectors. 
uh, in galactic coordinates. So you can see along the galactic plane here, uh, the fact that it's all white means that the polarization angles are all aligned um, perpendicular to the galactic plane. And that's what you're seeing is emission from, from dust grains lined up along the galactic plane. So it's kind of, that's, it's pretty, it's, it's kind of neat. Um, so given, with that in mind, um, our strategy for trying to <coughs> measure and characterize um, the, grab the B modes is to map a lot of the sky um, in five different wavelengths. So our next, the next sort of iteration of, of, of ACT will be advanced ACT, POL, um, which will be a survey starting next year. Um, we're going to cover 20,000 square degrees of sky, all the sky you can see from Chile. Um, and we'll measure the sky in five frequencies from 30 to 230 gigahertz to try and capture both the synchrotron and the dust emission um, with the same telescope. <coughs> um, and this will be a three-year survey that, that's, that should be starting uh, next year. And the strategy of that is um, to try and then check that you see the same signal. Well, there's a few different strategies. One is that this is also wide sky is also great for measuring more CMB lensing and measuring neutrinos and doing many other things. There are many other reasons why you want to go wide. But the motivation for going wide for gravitational waves is you can then compare different parts of the sky that are in completely different galactic locations, and you check that you see the same signal in all of them and the same kind of behavior. Um, so that's, that would be promising. So where do we think we can get to um, on neutrinos, the tiny, tiny energy scale and inflation, huge energy scale? Um, this is just a forecast, assuming things are all probably more perfect than they will be, um, of the expected probability of neutrino mass as a function of, sorry, of neutrino mass, where here would be the minimum mass possible in the minimal normal hierarchy scenario, 60 mE milli electron volts or 0.06 eV. Um, the current distribution of uncertainties is this blue curve, and we expect to get, first of all, to more than half that uncertainty to get to this green curve. We don't know where this, the mean is yet, of course, yet. It's a forecast. Um, and could shrink that even further um, with um, new measurements of new BAO measurements from, from the DESI, DESI experiment. Um, so to getting down to 45 or down to 25 milli electron volts. So we should start to see evidence, well, evidence, uh, hints <laughs> of neutrinos. And if actually it's an inverted hierarchy, and then if the, if the mass floor is not zero, we should actually start detecting it um, uh, in, the next, in the next few years. Um, and we'll be shrinking the number of neutrinos by a factor of the uncertainty by a factor of about six to an uncertainty of about 0.05. So if there are axions or other spe neutrino species hiding in there, we'll, we should find them. Um, we also forecast that we could get down to an uncertainty on the tensor to scalar ratio of 0.003. Um, this assumes pretty simple foreground behavior of the galaxy. And so I've put a little star there because I think that we need to do more work there to... to um, to be really sure um, of how that how the galaxy could affect that, um, but I don't think it's I don't think it's um, it's it's there may be a more pessimistic number, but I don't think it's completely unrealistic, um, and certainly our sensitivity should should get us there. Um, and as an aside, we have this complete overlap with LSST, so there's a ton of d exciting dark energy science to be done through cross correlations. Um, just in closing, let me say what the futures that that will that will be a that project will run in tandem with other ground-based CMB experiments for the next three or four years. What could the future look like for tackling these two questions and other questions um, in this area of science? Well, one of the things will be to make even more precise measurements of the small scale CM of the sorry of the polarized CMB um, to higher sensitivity, and that will uh, currently that seems to be taking the form of what we call S4, which is where we use multiple telescopes, multiple platforms to field, uh, this is actually a plot from Clem, Clem Pryke, I think he's in the room, <laughs> to field 100,000 detectors in the sky to reach mi one microkelvin per arc minute sensitivity um, over perhaps half the sky or more. Um, and that would require using multiple telescopes with these many, many detectors. Um, and that would be happening in the sort of early 2020s. Um, in tandem with that, I think that um, 
we'll still want to measure the larger scales in the sky. And right now, a very promising option for that is the JAXA-led Lightbird satellite, the Japanese space agency, um, that would be quite a small satellite and would just measure the very larger scales that you can't easily do from the ground. And the combination of those would be um, really exciting. So just to summarize, just to go back to this, 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 these two, I think we have discovery possibilities for neutrinos in the next decade. And I hope we have discovery possibilities for inflation. Um, well, let's just see what, what nature has, has given us. Um, and improved measurements of the CMB polarization will be central to both. Um, and that's the, the stuff that I will myself be working on. Advanced Act will be measuring half the sky from Chile um, starting next year. So keep your eyes out for it. Thanks. <laughs>
you, you touched on in one of your last slides uh, the potential for cross-correlation science in the context of uh, advanced act poll and overlap with LSST in the coming decade. And, mm. uh, CMBS4 uh, you know, offers possibilities for that. So aside from neutrinos, uh, what, what are some other things that you're excited about that we might, might be able to get out of such cross-correlations? I think one of them is um, the kinetic synapsal diverge effect. So um, here you can uh, look for um, the CMB is distorted by the motion of electrons, and so we can use uh, this effect on the CMB to look at how um, well look at the motion of structure nearby. And if you then can, if you can find out, um, you you can map out where the galaxies are, where the clusters are, with with um, large scale structure probes, and then you can correlate that with the CMB kinetic synapsal Dovich effect, and you can you can probe. Um, the motion of, um, of large scale structure, which could tell you things about gravity, many things. Um, but there's, I think also that what, where another, I think will be very helpful to many of the probes like cosmic shear and galaxy clustering in the you know quest for understanding dark energy. So if there are things that CMB lensing can do that are that can help sort of mitigate systematic uncertainties by through cross correlation. So trying to check that the biases as you expect and that other systematics are as you expect. Um, so there are these various things. Okay, well let's thank our speaker again.